everyone, and welcome to episode 30, Remastered. This episode will be all about the future evolution of life on Earth. Because, after all, what kind of history lesson would this series be if we didn't take a look at all of these trends that we've been following for billions of years and use them to predict where we're going into the future? Where the evolutionary history of life is going into the future? In the previous episode, I talked about the Holocene Epoch. This 10- to 13,000-year period saw the emergence of agriculture, and the rise of city-states, and medieval kingdoms, and caliphates, and empires, and the eventual industrialization of the modern world. The civilizational momentum of 10,000 years brings us, at the speed of time, into the present moment. The present moment is like a single frame in a perpetual, ongoing, billions-of-years-long movie and our exploration into the evolutionary roots of life has given us a look at the infinite number of frames that have preceded us. We can use this information to see what trends are currently pushing life in what directions, and we can make predictions about how this will affect life as these movie frames roll on into the future. That said, it's important to understand that evolution as a process is opportunistic, not deterministic. You can't really predict what evolution will produce in a million years or a billion years. Evolution happens in response to environmental pressures, and things like asteroid impacts or the eruption of a supervolcano really can't be predicted with any accuracy. Neither can mutations or how particular traits might emerge to particular variables. You can get a rough estimate or a rough prediction, but you're never going to be able to make a perfect prediction. How species respond in the long term really can't be predicted to any specificity beyond generalities or educated guesses based on similar precedents in the evolutionary record. The life on Earth has the momentum of more than 3.6 billion years of evolution, but it's coming up against some of the most rapid environmental change that the planet has ever seen. The industrialization of human civilization has led to widespread consumption of the planet's resources, and with it, the rapid destruction of many habitats and ecosystems. Deforestation is a huge problem all over the world, especially in South America, where countries like Brazil hold possession over vast and hugely important natural resources, like the Amazon rainforest but they're currently being led by right-wing politicians who want to cut down the Amazon and develop it for profit. This is short-sighted thinking, and it's leading to massive ecological degradation across the world. You also have ocean acidification, which is harming all kinds of shellfish and crustaceans, and the ocean temperature is rising, which has led to the bleaching and the death of most of the Great Barrier Reef and most corals throughout the ocean. Droughts and heat waves are scouring the Middle East, and industrial runoff has polluted numerous rivers across almost all parts of the world. I haven't even mentioned our pollution, like our microplastic contamination, which is just a nightmarish problem all on its own. All of these, among many other problems, are all radically altering the surface of our planet, taking ecosystems that have been established for millions of years and deconstructing them in what is to our human eyes and our human lifespans a slow-motion chaos. The loss of habitat leads to species extinction, and scientists believe that the current rate of extinction is anywhere from 1,000 to 6,000 times the background extinction rate, or the rate at which species go extinct under normal circumstances. Some estimates go as high as 10,000 times the background extinction rate, leading to a total extinction event that's predicted to be tens of times more intense than most of the previous mass extinctions. And make no mistake about it, this current mass extinction event, the sixth and largest major mass extinction in Earth's history, is caused by human behavior. Our industrialization, our consumption, the expansion of urban sprawl, and the expulsion of greenhouse gases, all of this contributes directly towards the rapid alteration of ecosystems on Earth and the accelerating rate of extinction. We call this the Holocene extinction because it's like the man-made exclamation point on the end of the Holocene epoch. But perhaps more appropriately, it's called the anthropogenic extinction because we are causing it. The extent of the anthropogenic extinction reaches farther than any disease or volcanic eruption or earthquake ever could. 
our influence on the planet rivals an asteroid, and perhaps even exceeds an asteroid impact in its raw destruction. Perhaps not all at once, but in totality. Where an asteroid strike is immediate, blanketing the world in ash and dust within a year, and causing a spike in extinction shortly afterward, our human impact is like an accelerating current, a wave built on the energy of the waves that preceded it. At first, our behavior had little effect on the global climate. We cut down trees and burned fields to make room for our grazing animals. And then we began hunting megafauna to extinction and burning oil and natural gas. Our industry developed and expanded, and now we're at a point where concrete and asphalt replaces forest and field, where lakes and rivers are polluted with industrial runoff, where chemicals and bits of plastic saturate the world's ecosystems and disrupt ecologies that have been stable for millions of years. Perhaps the most drastic ecological collapse in the extinction event involves the amphibians. The poor amphibians are being absolutely devastated by the changes in the climate, largely due to their vulnerability as a clade. The amphibian life cycle involves stages that are both on land and in water. As larvae, amphibians dwell in bodies of water like ponds and lakes and swamps and rivers. As adults, they live on land, typically in moist areas like tropical jungles, swamps, wetlands, uh, the riparian zones alongside a river, and other hot, humid regions. This means that they're affected by pollution and environmental changes that happen both on land and in the water. Where animals like moose or jaguar are only affected by terrestrial changes, and animals like sharks and whales are pretty much only affected by aquatic changes, the amphibians are vulnerable to twice the pollution and environmental degradation, because their life cycle has critical stages in both the water and on land. Furthermore, amphibians don't have dry skin or thick scales, or watertight feathers. They have highly permeable skin that's really absorptive of chemicals in the air and the water. Mining runoff, industrial wastes, pesticides, and other foreign chemicals are all easily absorbed by an amphibian's skin, which makes them particularly vulnerable to these kinds of contaminants. Many of these chemicals and pollutants have horrible effects on the amphibian populations. They can cause grotesque malformations, like extra arms or legs, deformed eyes, or failed development. Pesticides and herbicides and pharmaceuticals can screw with hormone regulation, or outright kill tadpoles and larvae. When even small amounts of estrogen contaminate an amphibian's habitat, like the estrogen that's used in industrial agriculture or in various pharmaceuticals, it can turn the entire population of tadpoles female. This can be disastrous, because a population of sexually reproducing species with all females and no males can't reproduce. Within a generation, the population crashes. The amphibians are even being affected by ultraviolet radiation coming through an ozone layer that's been weakened by pollution and ozone depletion. This increased radiation load damages the DNA in the vulnerable amphibian eggs. Atmospheric changes are destabilizing the habitats of amphibians across the world, making them drier and either too hot or too cold for the sensitive creatures to tolerate. As if all of this wasn't bad enough, you have human activity and human-caused environmental changes that are encouraging the spread of diseases and funguses that ravage amphibian populations. It's really unfortunate that the amphibians are being so heavily damaged by climate change and industrialization. And it's even worse that efforts to conserve and protect them were slow to start and gain momentum. It's really kind of depressing, but it's quite likely that the amphibians will be unable to evolve a way to endure climate change. It's quite likely that most, if not all, amphibians might be driven into extinction by human activity, and the changes that were wreaking on the world. I mean, just consider everything that they have going against them. A vulnerable life cycle that's doubly affected by pollution. Permeable skin that makes them so much more vulnerable to environmental contaminants. Atmospheric changes that make their habitats unlivable, not to mention pathogens and fungal infections and UV radiation. With all of these things and more working against the amphibians, their future doesn't look bright. Imagine a world where amphibians have been ground into extinction. 
what would this world look like? First, consider what amphibians eat. Their diet is mostly based on the creeping things of their humid habitats, like beetles, ants, spiders, caterpillars, worms, and all manner of flying insects. With the disappearance of the amphibians, all of these creatures would theoretically enjoy a world without numerous predators, and without the regular predation of the amphibians, these bugs and worms will experience population explosions. However, this theoretical outcome is unlikely, because recent data has shown that insects are actually having a population crash. Our widespread use of insecticides in industrial agriculture has destabilized and largely destroyed a huge portion of the insect populations that surround our crop fields. And it's even harmed insect populations that live far away from crop fields, far away from any kind of agriculture where they're spraying aerosolized insecticides. I covered a science news segment, I think last year, that was about a, a study that found that there was a 76% decrease in the flying insect biomass in Germany. Three quarters of the flying insect biomass was gone. There will be absolutely devastating downstream ecological consequences because of this. Because ecosystems rely on insects. Insects are the, the automatons that in their trillions clean up and digest a lot of debris on the forest floor, that pollinate plants, that provide food for all manner of larger organisms. And so when all of these insects go extinct, or maybe not go extinct, that's a little hyperbolic, if their populations crash, which they're doing right now, that almost certainly means destabilization and destruction and death for numerous species in the near future. Now, returning to the theoretical extinction of the amphibians, any animals that eat the amphibians for food will also suffer, as amphibious extinctions will reduce the quantity of food that's available to them. Consider the fact that amphibians are relatively low on the food chain. They're soft and squishy, sometimes poisonous, and they feast on bugs, which are themselves right above dead and dying organic matter on the food chain. Because the amphibians themselves are so low on the food chain, this implies that they're an important part of the diet of numerous animals that sit above them in the food chain. If the amphibians were to go extinct, all of these animals would suffer. And if they suffer, so too will all of the other animal species that depend on them for some capacity, whether it be food or some kind of symbiotic relationship. Theoretically, all of the animal species that feed on amphibians could find alternative food sources. They could maybe prioritize the other animals that they eat that aren't amphibians. I mean, they would have to if the amphibians went extinct. But what if the amphibians were such a huge part of the diet of numerous species that it, they were too big to be replaced by an alternative food source? What would happen then? Most obviously, some of these carnivores will necessarily starve to some degree as their available food resources shrink. As species go extinct, they leave holes in the ecology of their habitat. Other species adapt to fill the hole. They fill the niche, as they say, which promotes speciation. But before that can happen, the ecosystem is destabilized. All the organisms that depended on the extinct species for food, or for a symbiotic relationship, all of these species would suffer as well. Even those organisms that depended on the peripheral waste or debris of another species, like the small fish that clean the larger fish, or the birds that peck food out from between the teeth of a hippopotamus, even these species would be negatively affected if their mutualist or symbiote partner, or so-called host, went extinct. The effects that I'm discussing here aren't just limited to amphibians and the organisms that they interact with. It applies to literally every organism. Any organism that goes extinct will leave significant ripples behind in the ecology of their former habitat. Now, as you could probably tell, I could go on all day about hypothetical evolutionary paths, about hypothetical extinctions, and ecological ramifications. So I will. That's what this episode is about, after all. Predictions on future evolution. Okay, so let's think about the ocean, which is heavily affected by pollution and increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Also, as the atmosphere warms up, the ocean warms up. Both the surface of the ocean and the ocean itself are getting warmer, 
and this can have serious consequences on currents and atmospheric climate, not to mention all of the organisms that live in the ocean and are much more comfortable at the cooler, more normal climate. Ocean currents shuttle around cold and warm water. Where warm water comes to the surface, the air is warmed, and the local climate can be unusually warm given its latitude. This happens for the Pacific coast of North America, where a warm current moves northwards past Washington State in Canada up to the southern coast of Alaska, where it warms the air and supports a stunningly beautiful temperate rainforest ecology. If the ocean warming scuttles the currents or alters their flow in some way, ecosystems like the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest can be destroyed because the currents and the temperature patterns that they rely on have been destabilized. Likewise, currents of cold water will cool the air, making the local climates colder and less comfortable for life. Such is the case in Maine and New York and the New England area of North America, which are chilled by the Labrador currents coming down from the waters of Greenland and the Canadian Shield. If these ocean currents are destabilized and warmer water is somehow flushed against the coasts of New England, the cold water fish and the birds that prey on them will be driven out. The maritime ecological shift will have ripple effects deeper into the terrestrial ecologies, and just like in areas flooded by warm water, the entire habitat will shift and change. Native species are driven out, and this opens up niches for other species to adapt to and exploit. Warmer ocean water also means less ice. Since ice reflects light, but water absorbs light, this will only accelerate the heating process. We all know what happens when ice melts. It becomes liquid water. When the ice sheets and the glaciers of the world begin melting faster and faster, the liquid water literally raises the sea level. A rising sea level can be disastrous for lowland ecologies like wetlands and swamps, as they would become totally submerged. All of the swamp-dwelling creatures, like various alligators and frogs and birds, would be pushed out of their current habitat deeper into dry land. This could pose a serious threat to their existence, as many of these species cannot readily handle living in a drier, more rugged landscape. Rising sea levels would also drown all the world's beaches, taking with them most of the species that live there, like the crabs and fish and birds whose lives depend on the shallow water ecology. And you also have to consider the fact that the accumulation of mineral particles that make a beach, all of the accumulation of all of this sand, that can take hundreds of thousands of years. And so, if the beaches are drowned, the world simply won't have these habitats anymore. Not until the gradual pounding of ocean currents deposits enough silt on the world's shores to recreate them. Because evolution is opportunistic, responding in real time to present real-world challenges, a warmer ocean that creeps higher onto land will create ample evolutionary opportunities. By pushing marine and coastal organisms deeper inland, they'll be forced to adapt to the drier air and the greater temperature extremes. Species driven away from the equator by the heat will find themselves forced to confront seasonal changes in the day-night cycle, as well as lower temperatures and lower humidity. If any amphibians are able to survive this brutal anthropogenic mass extinction, their future evolution will likely involve a drier, thicker skin to protect them from the cold, dry air. Or they might see a greater use of behaviors like hibernation to survive in their new habitats. Or perhaps they might adapt to living exclusively in the water. On the other hand, ocean levels rising and filling the lowlands would bring bodies of water closer to regions that are historically quite dry. This intrusion of water would make the local climates more humid, and the humidity would retain heat, which would act to minimize the day-night temperature differences. Much like warm currents and warm air help the southern Alaska coastline, Warmer water that goes deeper into the Central American plains could support a denser ecology of wooded grassland, temperate forest, and maybe even all-out temperate rainforest in the middle of the continent. If this happens, it would encourage the proliferation of rainforest life while pushing out those native organisms better suited to the drier conditions.
As industry and consumer activity pumps carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, more and more carbon dioxide will dissolve into the oceans, and the water will get more acidic. This increased acidity might seem like a rather abstract thing, but it has very measurable and very tangible consequences. The acidity, or the pH of the ocean, determines how well minerals are cycled, and how they can chemically interact with other compounds. With rising levels of ocean acidity, species that use calcium salts, or some other mineral to build their shells, or their exoskeletons, are finding themselves unable to do so. Because of the higher acidity, their shells are thinner, softer, and less dense. They offer less protection and are generally unsuitable to do the things that shellfish need them to do. Rising ocean temperatures are also wreaking havoc on marine life. Specifically, rising ocean temperatures are causing corals to spit out their symbiotic algae. The algae are photosynthetic, and as part of this symbiotic relationship, they give the coral up to 90% of their photosynthetically created sugars. But with rising ocean temperatures, the corals are bleaching. They're expelling the algae and turning white, and eventually dying. This problem is accelerating, and it's wiping out massive expanses of coral reef across the world, like the Great Barrier Reef off the east coast of Australia, which, as of 2017, has lost more than half of its coral to death from bleaching. With their destruction will come the collapse of an extremely valuable ecological resource. The coral reefs are home to thousands of species of fish and plant, of mollusk, crustacean, worms, sponges, octopus, and more. All of these groups will get pushed closer to extinction as the coral reefs struggle to persist in the acidic oceans. To survive the collapse of their habitats, these reef-dwelling organisms will have to find new habitats that offer some of the things they needed from the reefs, things like protection from predators, a stable food supply, and communities of organisms that interact mutualistically. Okay, so let's move out of the oceans and onto dry land. How do terrestrial plants and other animals respond to climate change? How will this influence their evolution into the immediate future? The plants have experienced a huge shift in their selection pressures. Those plants that we humans cultivate for food are the most secure. Corns, grains, squash, tomatoes, potatoes, rice, all of these plants and more have had their evolutionary trajectory shackled to the commercial and industrial momentum of the human species. Because these plant species are so important to us, we'll go so far as to alter their genomes to make them better fit our needs. The immediate future of the evolution of these plants is almost entirely at the hands of the humans who cultivate and genetically modify them. And due to this genetic meddling, plants like tomatoes have longer shelf lives, apples can endure prolonged oxygen exposure without browning, and potatoes are disease-resistant. Other plants are given traits or modifications that make them resistant to drought, or to insect parasites, or to any number of other problems. From a certain perspective, our genetic modification is like a hyper-accelerated, hyper-focused form of evolution. I mean, it's kind of questionable to call it evolution, because, I don't know, from a certain perspective, you could say it's like hyper-evolution, but from, a, from another perspective, you could say that it's the exact opposite. These changes aren't due to natural selection, they're due to artificial selection. It's not random mutations and opportunistic adaptations that we're seeing, it's deliberate alterations of specific genes for desired outcomes. To fortify plants and ensure their existence and proliferation, we've basically given them 50 million years worth of evolutionary development within just a few years of lab work. Outside of the lab, other plants are forced to endure the changing climate on their own, without the benefit of human interference. A serious problem is the predicted collapse of angiosperm populations. The angiosperms, or the flowering plants, often form symbiotic relationships with pollinating insects. As the insects fly from plant to plant to gather nectar, they get coated in pollen, and this pollen gets carried from plant to plant with them, where fertilization can happen. 
our industrial use of pesticides and insecticides, like neonicotinoids, has been devastating for species of pollinating insects. And most famous of these cases are the bees. The bee populations crashed in the years leading up to 2013, and this led many people to fear for the future of the species. You might have read the headlines a few years ago talking about stuff like colony collapse disorder. If we don't figure out this colony collapse disorder and find some way to cure it or stop it from happening, then a larger, more planetary bee collapse is possible, and a widespread, planet-spanning bee collapse would necessarily be associated with a collapse of most or all of the plant species that depend on the bees for pollination. It's possible that the threat of pollinator extinction will put pressure on angiosperm populations to adapt ways to reproduce and pollinate without relying on insect species. This might mean evolving to depend more on the wind, or it might involve the use of a new insect which adapts to fill the niche left open by the bees. But either way, a collapse of the bees would be disastrous. For the angiosperms, the collapse of the bees would be like an evolutionary shock, disrupting a harmonious symbiosis that's existed for millions of years. Alright, so enough about all of the animals and plants and whatnot. Enough about how they'll evolve. You want me to get to the good part. The part about human evolution. It poses some fascinating questions. Like... What evolutionary selection pressures are working on us today, in our urban environments and interconnected cultures? How is genetic drift quietly altering our gene pool? What known or newly discovered mutations in the human genome are beneficial and seem to be spreading? And more generally, where is this collective tide of evolutionary movement taking us? What will our descendants look like in 5 million years? In 10 million? 100? If any descendants of the humble Homo sapiens still exist a billion years into the future, what would they look like? What will they be like? Naturally, these questions are very difficult, if not impossible, to answer. But data can be taken and estimates made, and to a degree limited by the functional capacity of our tools and tactics, we can make short-term predictions with decent accuracy, with long-term predictions inherently being much fuzzier. If the human species satisfied the Hardy-Weinberg hypothesis, we wouldn't be evolving at all. No mutations, no gene flow, no genetic drift, and no natural selection. Well, it's pretty obvious that we're still subject to mutations. The human gene pool is characterized by thousands and thousands of alleles, and mutations continue to alter existing alleles and create new ones. Try and think of a couple mutations that could emerge in human populations, which would be able to persist in the gene pool and spread. Mutations that increase muscle density, or that improve the capacity of the body to metabolize fats, or that reduce the risk of heart disease, all of these potentially beneficial alleles and more currently exist in the human species, and they could possibly persist long into the future perhaps even going to fixation one day, thousands or millions of years into the future. I think the most striking example of human evolution exists in the people of Tibet, who, for thousands of years, have lived at altitudes much higher than almost every other human population. Studies have found that about 34 mutations have emerged in the Tibetan population in the 2,800 years since they've diverged from their Han Chinese cousins. And one of these mutated genes, called EPAS1, allows them to thrive in the low-oxygen, high-altitude environment of Tibet. The allele exists in nearly 90% of Tibetans, and less than 10% of Han Chinese, which means it's indicative of a major evolutionary division. This mutated allele hasn't been extensively studied, but it's believed to balance anaerobic and aerobic respiration to make Tibetan cells much more oxygen efficient. As a result, the Tibetans can engage in physical activity at high altitudes without the rapid exhaustion and delirium that affects everyone else at similar altitudes. This is perhaps the most obvious and significant example of evolutionary divergence between human populations. Another example includes oceanic populations that engage in freediving. 
While freediving, they gather clams, or they use a spear to hunt fish. And this has been a traditional hunting method for these people for thousands of years. And there's an interesting cultural element here where those people who were the most effective underwater hunters would bring back the most food, the most resources. And within their culture, they would be rewarded. They would be rewarded with, uh, with praise, you know, reputation. People would like them. They would appreciate their hunting skill. It would be something that people would, uh, would commend and recognize. And this would open up more reproductive opportunities for them. The best hunters were the most prestigious in the society. And so they were most likely to have children and pass on their genes. And for that matter, by nature of being the best hunters, they were more likely to be able to better feed their family. The evolutionary result of these people spending so long fishing while freediving, you know, fishing while moving around underwater and holding their breath, has resulted in these populations being able to hold their breath and swim underwater for extremely extended periods of time. Gene flow is obviously still affecting the human species, perhaps more so now than at any other time in human history. Modern technology like the internet, commercial aviation, and oceanic shipping has enabled a global culture of interconnectedness. People have more opportunity than ever before to migrate to other areas and integrate into foreign populations. Economically, technologically, sociologically, all the factors are there that enable people to spread and interbreed. This has the effect of reducing diversity between population groups, as alleles from each group get shared and spread and integrated across all the others. With more and more people migrating and marrying into their host cultures, this gene flow has really accelerated. As people continue to interbreed across national and geographic boundaries, the genetic differences that defined us a hundred years ago will slowly fade away as the human population as a whole becomes much more genetically homogenous. Our human populations are also still being affected by genetic drift. Genetic drift is like the background noise, the random fluctuations of allele frequencies that shape greater genetic trends. Mating within the human species is largely non-random. A Chinese person living in China is much more likely to reproduce with a Chinese person than they are with a Canadian, or a Brazilian, and vice versa. There are numerous sociological and cultural barriers that prevent truly random mating, like wealth differences, religious or political differences, and even aesthetic preferences. This rolls into natural selection, which includes the sexual selection that's present between females and males as they compete within their gender groups for a chance to mate. While human populations really aren't affected by predators anymore, we're still vulnerable to diseases and cultural selection pressures. Diseases can evolve rapidly, and the emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria means the defenses of modern medicine might not hold out for much longer. We might be long overdue for a plague or some other pathogen to come and clean out an overpopulated house. Culturally, there are strict pressures put on individuals to compete. People have to work and participate in a fast-paced modern world in order to gather the resources necessary to reproduce and raise healthy children. This kind of global, industrial worker culture presents a set of pressures, and human beings, as a population of individuals with variable qualities, respond with varying success to these pressures. Those that can fit in and thrive in our competitive economic arenas are much more likely to thrive and produce healthy offspring than those who don't. Those who can find a role to play in the modern world will find their traits to be advantageous, while those who can't adapt to the changing world will be left behind ideologically and technologically, and over a longer period of time, they'll be left behind genetically. There are other trends that we can see in the human species that might be indicative of a potential evolutionary pattern. For example, we're becoming more intelligent, we're becoming better at abstract thinking, and we're becoming better at three-dimensional visualization. Remember how I described that genetic modification of plants was like creating a guided, hyper-accelerated form of evolution? Well, if we can do this to plants, and we can also do it to animals, then that naturally means that we can do it to people. 
Researchers in China have already started using technologies like CRISPR to alter the genomes of human embryos. So the technology to alter our own genes is here, today, right now. If we really use human genetic modification to its maximum potential, the future of human evolution is really an open book. We could be whatever we want to be. Whatever we can design, we can create. Through implanting genes from other organisms into our own bodies, we might be able to give ourselves traits that, right now, only exist in our animal friends. Like how birds can detect magnetic fields, or how mongooses can shake off the effects of snake venom, or like dogs with their superior sense of smell. Any traits that we can potentially isolate to a discrete number of genes, we can possibly isolate and transplant into our own bodies. Of course, this brings up a host of ethical considerations. Is it ethical to deliberately change the genome of an embryo? Is it ethical to change your own genome in such a way that the changes will be passed down to your offspring? These questions might seem straightforward if we're treating genetic diseases, but the conversation drives into a deep shade of gray when we start talking about cosmetic and elective modifications. If you're excited by the concept of predicting the future evolution of life on Earth, and you want to know more, consider watching a TV series called The Future is Wild. It's a documentary of sorts where the creators interview various biological, physical, and theoretical scientists and hypothesize what life would be like 5 million, 100 million, and 200 million years into the future. I think that's a good place to wrap up this episode. I hope I gave you some food for thought. I hope I inspired you to think about how life will adapt and respond to our continued industrialization and, in the distant future, how humanity might experience our own extinction or deliberate abandonment of the Earth. If you like this episode, hit the like button. And if you like this series and want to hear more, then hit the subscribe button so that you can see new episodes every Monday. And as always, thanks for listening.